Welcome to Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. Coming up, Wesley Hunt. He's running for Congress in the state of Texas. Why should you care? Listen and find out. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. I'm always interested to talk to people who are running for office or who are in office about why it's important for them to give service back to the country. What are their motivations? I remember someone asked me once, why would you want to run for office? There are three reasons, power, popularity, or service. And to me, it's always been about service, but I realize I'm a little Pollyanna in that respect. Let's ask Wesley Hunt. He's given me permission to call him Wes, so that's what we'll call him. He's running for Congress down in Texas. Sir, thank you very much for your time and welcome. Wow, well, thank you, man, for having me. Really appreciate it. It's my honor. Thank you so much. Well, tell me what your motivation is in running for Congress in Texas. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's the latter. It's the third one. It's the service piece of this that's really kind of drawn me to serving my country yet again. Um, and just kind of give you a bit of a background on how I got here. And I think a lot of people do ask that question, you know, especially given the divided times that we have right now and how crazy <laughs> Washington seems. Why would you be doing this right now? And really, at this point, the only answer is service. And I, I come from a military family. So uh, my dad uh, did 23 years in the Army. He's a retired lieutenant colonel. He was an officer. Uh, my sister went to West Point and my family first and then went on to serve 23 years active duty as a military intelligence officer. And then I went to West Point, my family second, I did eight years active duty. I was an Apache helicopter pilot. Uh, I flew 55 combat air missions in Baghdad, did two tours of duty in Saudi Arabia as well. And then went on to Cornell University where I earned three master's degrees in four years in business policy <laughs> and industrial and labor relations. And my brother, is also a West Point graduate. He's 10 months and eight days younger than me. So we're like Irish twins. We're actually really tight. Oh, you are. Uh, My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> He's West, I'm West Point 04. He's West Point 05. He served five years in the Navy and then uh, got his master's degree from Harvard Business School and then now resides here in Houston with his beautiful family. So there's about 60 years worth of military service just in my immediate family. And it started off with my parents raising us to understand that this is the greatest country in the world. And if we don't have people that are competent and able to continue to keep this the greatest country in the world, then we're going to lose it for our posterity. So service runs in my family. It was my yeah. family's mandate. You always find something to do to make your country better. And that's literally what this is all about for me. I, I love that answer, and I can hear your sincerity in there. And clearly, you guys have walked the walk, right? This family has walked the walk. Um, you also sound like a bunch of brainiacs going to all these, you know, Harvards and stuff. You know, that's that's what they called us when when I was a kid. Oh, you're the brainy ones. But anyway, um, it, it's it's a quite a background you have. And Thank you. You know what? You you mentioned it the times that we're in, and that your parents raised you to believe that this is the greatest country in the world. My parents did the same. I have an Hispanic father, yeah. my late father, and an Irish German mother. But, you know, the fact that my father's family came here, immigrated legally, and wow. he was first kid in his family, a huge family, to go to college, the only child of 11 to go to college. So it, it's a, it, I, I feel a, a little bit of a kinship with you in that, yes. you know, this is how you're raised. It's you're raised to do the right things. The difference between you and me is while I have some measure of brown in me, you have some measure of black in you. And a right. lot of people, and I hate to just generalize this, but they, they feel like blacks in this country are oppressed and yeah. that others are the oppressors. And that's a big point of contention right now. That's it's causing a lot of division in this country. And, and, and a lot of the people who hold this view, Wes, 
are white college grads and Maybe I'm not. not sure what their motivation, what they are trying to solve, but how do you come down on all of this? So there was a time in this country where that was absolutely the case. Actually, there was a time in this country where my father, who uh, who, who just turned 73 a few weeks ago, uh, sat in the back of buses and drank from colored only water fountains when he was a child. My dad never ever had a class with a with a white person from K through college because he went to he went to an to a uh, historically black college university, Southern University. My great great grandfather was a slave. He was born on Rosedown Plantation, about 33 miles north of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Rosedown Plantation is still there today. This is my great great grandfather. So let me get this right. Three of his great great grandchildren attended West Point. Three of them had the honor of serving our country. We attended Ivy League schools, and one of them is going to be a United States congressman in a 70% white majority district that a Republican wins, that a, a Republican president wins by at least 30 points today. And so my question that I always push back on these, you know, intellectually elite, you know, white people that are making this stuff up is that are you really not going to talk about the progress that we have made from generation to generation to generation? I understand we're not perfect, okay? No country is perfect. But as somebody that's literally served all over the world, I'm going to tell you it gets no better than this. And by the way, no other country makes that kind of progress in that truncated period of time. I'm not saying we should do a victory lap. And I'm not saying we should pat ourselves on the back. What I am saying is, is that we should be very pragmatic with how we view race relations in this country. This country has become a meritocracy especially in the military where my family served. And we continue to get better with every single generation. And I just find it interesting that they leave that part out, that the guy yeah. like me sitting here, the congressman in a Republican seat as a black guy, which means that a lot of white people had to vote for me. I just won a Republican primary with 10 people in it and earned 56% of the vote. And I ran against nine white guys and I still won. And I won not because of the color of my skin, but because of my background and my service and my willingness to serve this community. And that's exactly what America has evolved to. And I am literal proof of that. You made that point so succinctly and so beautifully. And it's it's a point that I think is made better coming from you than from me. But I do try to talk about this too, because I just... I don't understand why that part gets lost, why, why we overlook the progress and we keep hearkening back to the way America once was. And, and by the way, our founders, many of whom were slave owners, yes, were living time. in a time that that was part of the time, right? And it wasn't just here in America. It was around the world. world. Yes. And, oh, yeah. and oh, by the way, there's still slavery in other parts of the world. And- so someone pushed back on me about this, Wes, saying that the majority of people incarcerated in this country are African-American or black mm -hmm. and that they are slave labor because they only get paid 50 cents on the hour. And yet the prisons charge five bucks an hour to the companies who are yeah. something about this. So I, I looked at that argument and my first reaction was, well, when you're incarcerated, and, and and I think the criminal justice system needs some some I agree. changes. We'll, we'll I get agree. to that later. But if you are incarcerated, it's because you committed a crime. You. No one is forcing you to commit the crime. Thank you. And, and yeah. where am I wrong there? You're not you're not wrong at all. And this is an issue of personal responsibility and accepting personal responsibility. I'm gonna tell you a quick story about my dad. Okay, my dad my dad is my hero. He's the greatest man I know. When I, I went to a small private school uh, here in Houston, Texas, and I remember there was one teacher there that I could, and I will actually say, probably had an issue with some with 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 black people, and everyone kind of understood, and everyone kind of knew that. And, and one day we were not supposed to be in the cafeteria, but my buddy and I were like, "Look, I want to grab some meat real quick, and I know this period we're not supposed to be in there. We're going to sneak down there and go grab something and pay for it, obviously, but we weren't supposed to be in the cafeteria at that time. So we kind of snuck down there." And we went there and we were caught red handed. And, here, and here, actually, here's what happened. My friend and I both got punished, but I got more punishment than my buddy. And my buddy was a white guy and I was a black guy. And the woman that, do that doled out the punishment clearly kind of had an ax to grind with black people. And everyone kind of knew that. And I went home and I said, Dad, I got in trouble today. And you know what happened? 
I was in the cafeteria. I know I shouldn't have been there, but guess what? Like, it doesn't matter because my buddy got less punishment than I got. And you know what, dad? You know why. And what are you going to do about it? And my dad looked at me and he said, son, did you know you were you were not supposed to be in a cafeteria? And I said, well, yeah, dad. But this guy got less punishment. He goes, well, guess what? If you were doing the right thing in the first place, then we wouldn't be having this conversation now, would we? <laughs> and he turned around. And, and I'll never forget, like, he, I was in his office. And he turned around and started going back to work. And I was shocked and I walked away and it dawned on me that my dad was holding me accountable for my behavior and what and my and my punishment was not somebody else's fault. That was my fault. Later on, I found <laughs> out that he actually he did go talk to that teacher and actually our sentencing, if you want to call it that, ended up being equal. But I didn't find out that my dad talked to that teacher until I was a sophomore at West Point. And this happened oh when my I was gosh. in the eighth grade. This happened when I was in the eighth grade. And the reason why my dad didn't tell me he did that is because he never wanted me to be the victim. So the person that's complaining to you about the about, well, it, it's slave labor because they're getting they're getting, you know, paid cents on the dollar for the work that they're doing. Wait a minute. You're exactly right, ma'am. They chose to be there based on their behavior and their actions. If we hold people right. accountable for their behavior and their actions, then maybe they wouldn't be in that place in the first place. It's pretty simple, and yet we've come to this point in society, Wes, where it seems like the people who are committing the issues are given more comfort and forgiveness, and victims are getting lost in this whole thing, too. I I, want to touch more on that when we come back, but I also want to, because you're in Texas and running for U.S. Congress, I want to touch on the border issue. It, It certainly hurts more in Texas than most places, although... Now you hear mayors of Washington, D.C. and New York City New York? saying, hey, yeah. yeah, yeah, too many immigrants. Uh, okay, okay, we'll talk about that with Wesley Hunt when we come back. Yes, ma'am. So if you're like me, you just can't get all the fruits and vegetables you need every day. It's really difficult. The CDC says you need what? I think six cups of fruits and vegetables a day. I just, I can't get that in, but you know what I can get in? Field of greens, one scoop. I put it in a little bit of water. I shake it up and then I add maybe my favorite juice or my favorite soda water. And then I'm getting great vitamins, nutrients, and all the stuff that I need. So I'm going to ask you to check out Field of Greens. Go to fieldofgreens.com. And the promo code is TAFOYA, T-A-F-O-Y-A, or you can go fieldofgreens.com, promo code TAFOYA, and try this stuff. I'm telling you, I feel better. My energy is off the charts. And if you go and use the TAFOYA promo code, I got 15% off your first order for you. And then get another 10% off when you subscribe for recurring orders. And something tells me you're going to want to go ahead and subscribe. So you get the 15% off and then another 10% off because you mix this stuff into whatever beverage you want. And you get this full spectrum of essential vegetables and fruits, not just any old vegetables, the stuff you really need, not just random fruits, the stuff that matters. So go to fieldofgreens.com. I I can't say it enough. This stuff is, it, it works fieldofgreens.com. Use the promo code TAFOYA, T-A-F-O-Y-A, to get your 15% off. We're back with Wesley Hunt, and he's, again, giving me permission to call him Wes, so I'm not taking advantage of the situation. I've been given the okay to call him Wes, and and that's nice and short, so I appreciate that, sir. No problem. <laughs> um, the One of the biggest issues in America, I think, right now, one of the biggest problem spots for us is the Southern border. And you're right there in the state of Texas where so much of this is going on. What do you see down there that the rest of America, uh, so much of America chooses, I guess, to ignore? What are you seeing? So it's absolute chaos at the border. And this administration has completely failed us all. And, And what I find fascinating being a military guy is that when you're put in charge of something, at a minimum, you just show up and try your best to lead from the front. Kamala Harris was made the border czar. The border czar. And she hasn't been to the border. Now, and of her own admission, she hasn't been to Europe either. 
but <laughs> that's another conversation yeah. for a different day. Like, like, how are you put in charge of something as a vice president and then you don't even show up? We've had over 3 million people that we know of illegally enter this country. We've had enough fentanyl to enter this country to kill every American at least five times. Think about the crime. Think about what's happening at the border. Think about us relinquishing our power to the cartels at the border. And by the way, somebody that's been all over the world, the world is laughing at us. Other countries have borders. Other countries have immigration laws and rules, and they enforce them strictly. So they're looking at us like, wait a minute, like, are you a country of laws? Do you have a constitution or not? And what kind of policies is this administration implementing that's completely ignoring our constitution? But what really irks me the most about this is there are so many people, quite frankly, black people, brown people, no, it, your, your ancestry that came to this country, they did it the right way. And guess what? Now, if you cross the border and you can just skip the line of everybody else, how fair is that? So I think what we're doing and what we're setting up for, for, the, for the future of this country is an absolute disaster. And then now you're seeing liberal, liberal states and liberal cities that want to defund the police. And at the same time, they want open border policies. They're now complaining about the issue at the border. And then now complaining at the crime spike that we have seen in this country in just the last 18 months. To us, the hypocrisy is nauseating. And the good thing is, is that the American people are paying attention and people like me are stepping up and speaking out. And this is not about being racist. I mean, I, I, trust me, I am not racist. This is about <laughs> having laws and abiding by our constitution. It's just right. that simple. It, it is that simple. And and I, I'm, I've been twisting my mind to figure out, Wes, why... They want this chaos. It seems to me that chaos is sort of the goal. You have these liberal DAs, these yeah. progressive DAs in, you know, obviously in San Francisco, he got ousted, but we've got one in LA, Philadelphia, New yeah. York, who seem to want to sow this chaos. They seem to want to put these people back on the streets. And I'm trying to figure out what the motivation is. Is it to ruin the country from the inside out? Because we know damn well, and you certainly do, that the military isn't going to let the outside come in and ruin us. So yeah. is are they trying to ruin us from the inside out? I just, I, I don't understand why they'd want to do that. In my opinion, ma'am, this is a power grab. This happens about every 30 to 40 years. Uh, um, you have you have the idea of socialism and Marxism that breeds this, that breeds this ugly head every you know 40 years or so. And people think it's a good idea. Bigger government is a good idea. If we're giving people money so you don't have to work, that's a good idea. If we print $3 trillion and then we end up in a hyperinflative state, it just makes people more reliant on the government and then these individuals have more power. If there's more crime, then we get to take the guns away from the citizenry and then we get to implement our policies more with zero backlash or zero recourse. Oil. This is all a plot to change the very fabric of America. The last time we saw this actually was in, was in, was in the 70s. As a West Point guy, we're all kind of American historians just by nature. You kind of have yeah. to be. And back in the yeah. 70s, th that's actually what begat Jimmy Carter. And that's when we saw, you know, basically this country was in complete upheaval. And what happened? We ended up having 12 years of Republican leadership with Reagan and with Bush. And that's because people realized that that's not the way we have to go. One of my best friends has one of the best quotes of all time. He said, the problem with the American dream is that it came true. So when it came true, then people realize, so what do we have to complain about? Because now we actually do have some equality. Yeah, we've actually had a black president. Yeah, I mean, white people will elect a black guy as their, as their congressman for their community. So now what do we do? Um, this, is, this is not good for us because now people have autonomy. They realize that they can achieve the American dream. They realize that within a couple of generations, they could be successful broadcasters and successful podcasters like yourself. And then now all of a sudden, that then scares those that want the government to run at all. And now they're trying to take it back. And the good thing is, is that we always know this doesn't work. This is the highest gas prices I've seen in my lifetime. This is the highest inflation I've seen in my lifetime. This is the worst border crisis we've seen in our lifetime. Putin is running amok. Iran is on a path to have another nuclear weapon. And the world is literally falling apart. And it happened in a year and a half. And we're paying attention. It, I hope everyone's paying attention. I mean, oh, you're yeah. We are now. Right now. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, if you, you know, gas prices will wake everybody up. That is for right? sure. So will, em so will yeah. empty shelves and inflation. You know, people... I, 
Yeah. I'm amazed, you know, look, I go to the grocery store or, and I travel a lot too. And so it's not just in my town, but other towns. And I see uh, things just feel different in these stores. I'm seeing empty shelves and, you know, you can't get baby, baby formula. formula. And this, this yeah. is America. And yeah. then some people will say, oh, you feel so entitled and so pretty. Well, yeah, you know what? Because we're really good at what we America. put our minds to doing here <laughs> right. in America. We're really good at this. Right. And why shouldn't we be? And by the way, when we're better, a rising tide lifts all boats, other countries benefit too. We have That's more right. to give. We're, we're the most generous country on the planet. I, right. I'm, I, you know, you and I see this and then, I, you know, I've lost friends who Me too. just- Disagree. You too. Yeah. They, they weren't your friends. They weren't your friends to begin with. Don't worry. Well, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember that. It, what's sad to me is that we did have connection points. Whether yeah. it was our kids playing baseball together or whatever, we had connections. And 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 these arguments over Roe v. Wade and yeah. guns and you know this stuff that that it's dividing us this much and that people aren't thinking past their initial anger to, yeah. to, to what this stuff really means. It drives me crazy. But yes. like I said, you're giving me hope. I'm, I'm not the only one, ma'am. Trust me. There is a, there is a cascade okay. of us that are running for office, a bunch of veterans. If you've noticed most veterans that are actually running for office now, they're Republicans because we, we understand what it means to work together to save our country. And, 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 and the points that you're making, let's even, let's talk about Roe v. Wade for two seconds. The, the only thing yeah. our, our the only thing our Supreme Court did was return the power back to the states to decide on this issue. That's yeah. all that was done. Nothing was banned. Nothing was changed. It's now up to the states. And that's what, that's how federalism works. That's how right. our Constitution works. Every state has a governor. Every state has their own state legislature. Every state. So they can decide their own rules and how they want to govern themselves. The number one role of the federal government, which is what I'm running for, is to keep our citizens safe. And then get out the way and let the states run their own individual <laughs> lives. And if yeah. you don't like your state or if you don't like the laws of your state, then our Constitution allows you to pick up your stuff and go move to a state of your liking. This right. is a free country. Yeah. So essentially, our Supreme Court didn't take the power away from women. They returned the power back to the states so that right. each community could make their own decisions on a very complicated, complex issue. Yeah. And, I, you know, Texas is one of those states that is really putting some restrictive uh, yeah. policies in place. I, I know that you are a pro-life guy. You know what? Yeah. Let's get into this after the break, because this is an important topic as well in terms of what you are telling women in Texas are their yeah. options. We'll talk with that with Wesley Hunt about that when we come back. You know, since November of last year, the stock market has plummeted, but gold has been on the rise. Gas prices are a joke. The stock market is all over the place. Inflation is the worst it's been in four decades. And now we have this war between Russia and Ukraine. And the bottom line is markets don't like instability. But the good news is you have options. Gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold for protection. Gold provides a hedge against inflation and a weakening dollar. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust when investing in gold and silver. You need an investment that's going to protect your wealth and your retirement. Call Legacy Precious Metals today. Be proactive while there's still time. Remember 2008? Those who invested in gold saw huge gains while others lost their retirements. Legacy Precious Metals can advise you on all of your options for investing in gold and silver. You can speak to an IRA expert at Legacy Precious Metals at 866-528-1903, 866-528-1903, or download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. So grateful to have Wes Hunt here running for U.S. Congress. He's down in the state of Texas, grew up in the Houston area, served. You've heard him. You've heard everything up to this point. So in Texas, some strict abortion laws are being pushed. And personally, I've got a friend who's moving to Austin and yeah. she's worried about it. And she's she's moving to Austin to be with her, her, her soon to be husband yeah. and 
I think they want to have children, but she also feels very strong and she's Mm pro-choice. What would you, what do you say to women who, who want that option? Obviously we have contraception. We have a million ways to stay not pregnant. Right. Things happen. What are you telling women in Texas? So I'm somebody that does have stipulations. I'm, I'm rape, incest, and life for the mother. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in favor of that. So I'm not. Uh, I, I believe that that's a very tough decision for everyone to make, and that's up to their. That that's up to the individual choice. But what I try to tell right. people, ma'am, is this, and that's what we are trying to do is is prevent the 99 percentile problem. So rape, incest, life for the mother. You know, it's like actually less than one percent of all abortions. So yeah, so I will lament and I will say that you know what, I'm okay with that. But but what we're really trying to prevent, in my mind, ma'am, is actually real life genocide that's happening every single day in this country. Um, as a black man, I, I'm really kind of offended by the insinuation and the notion that 38 percent of abortions in this world are at the hands of black women. 38 percent. Yet we make up only 12 percent of the population. In New York City last year, there were more aborted black babies than were born. So if you are pro-life or pro-choice, I really don't care where you are on the spectrum. You have to hear those numbers, and that should terrify you. Because are we okay with living in a culture, living in a society that, that, that will allow a minority group to exist on this earth at a different rate than anybody else? I want to have that conversation that if you look at a bell curve, I want to talk about, you know, the 70, 80 percent solution. And let's leave off the tails. And really, a lot of people that are moving to Texas, and I, I understand this is a very difficult decision. I understand this is a very tough choice. Um, um, but look, you know, my sister went to West Point. I went to West Point. You know, my brother is 10 months and eight days younger than me. So you could probably figure out that must have been a bit of a shock to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> but but that young man, that young man was given a chance to live. And what did he do with it? <laughs> he went to West Point. He went to Harvard. He served in the Navy. And, and I think he's done quite well for himself. And so I want to talk more about giving people the opportunity and the chance to live. And if we could talk about that, then maybe we could live in a society that's OK, that's not OK with having one third, over one third of all aborted babies being people of color. That's a compelling argument that you make for sure. And, and, and uh, I've had people tell me, you know, look, I do work with the NICU, uh, you know, these uh, infants who are born prematurely yeah. at, at five months along, and they end up growing into becoming <laughs> these productive walking human beings who are giving something to the world. Yes. I think we could probably agree on, I, I'm with you. I look, I'm pro-choice with exceptions. I'm pro-choice yeah. up until about 12, 15 weeks. And then to me, even, and, and the more I learn and listen to people like you, the more I think twice about what I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the way yeah. I'm feeling about it. The conversation you're right needs to be had. Mm-hmm. I think it needs to be had. So, it needs to be substantive. And like I said, like our, our most people, man, if I'm being honest with you, I've had this conversation a lot. And I think actually most Americans are actually exactly where you're at. There, there's, there's this yeah. eight to 12 week period. People kind of debate that. But after that, people really actually, when they, when they actually go down and look at what's, what's happening in a woman's body, what's happening to that little person that's growing, even at 10, 12, 13 weeks, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's a brain forming and there's hands and there's feet and, he's, and he or she is moving around. And so, like, I, I do get the point that, like, look, things happen. People have tough choices to make. And, and, I, and I do think we should have conversations here in, here in Texas. The rule is actually the heartbeat bill, which happens around six, seven weeks, right around there. Uh, that's the law. And, you know, we're, we're talking about reducing that even even further. But before we do that, this is how we need to have a conversation within our states, yeah. within our communities, and within our state reps and our state senate, because these are the people that decide these kinds of questions, and then they have a better chance at getting it right to the liking of that community. Right. I couldn't agree more. It's uh, There's a first level thinking that everyone has, which was, oh my gosh, Roe v. Wade was overturned, abortion is banned. No, yeah. wrong. You've got to no. get to the second level thinking and then the third yes. level and then the fourth and have these conversations, yes. which which leads me to my final interchange with you. And you've used the word conversation a lot and you you are clearly 
a very thoughtful person with an extremely rich background of experience. What gives you hope or faith that the lack of unity in this country can be healed, that we can, uh, you're always going to have some, right, some people who are going to be unhappy because they choose to be unhappy with whatever it is. But as a nation, Joe Biden promised to unite us. He's done nothing to unite us. I think he's divided us even he's further. Been worse. He's, he's, what he's gives you hope? Yes. What gives you hope? What gives you faith that we can come together? So what gives me faith is, is again, this is why I think America is the greatest experiment in, of, of all time. And that's because, man, we've been way worse than this. There was a time in this country where this country ripped itself apart over slavery, literally. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of fellow Americans were killing each other over slavery. There were people that were West Point graduates. And depending on what state you were from, when you graduated from West Point, this is you served four years with these people. You train with them. You went to class with them. And then you entered a country at war. And if you were from the North, you wouldn't fought for the North. And if you were from the South, you wouldn't have fought from the South. And you had West Point classmates that were friends that were fighting against each other. At West Point, there's a Grant Barracks and there's a Robert E. Lee Barracks. Put that in perspective. From the same school. There was a time in this country during Vietnam where men and were men and soldiers, were men, men in uniforms would return home from risking their lives, doing their country's biddings, and they were spat on. They were spat on for serving their country by wearing their uniform in public. When I came back from combat, from my combat tours, I came home to a hero's welcome. And we recovered from that. Look, where we're at right now compared to those times, this is nothing. It really is. And, and I think over time, we kind of have to put things in perspective and then leaders step up and lead and then pull the pendulum of unity back to where we can all agree that being an American is a pretty good thing. And it usually starts with a combat veteran. In 2018, we had the fewest number of veterans serving in Congress uh, since World War II. And the reason why that's fascinating is because veterans are supposed to be apolitical. Right? We serve the country. We serve the, at the pleasure of the president. We serve to defend this nation regardless of who the president is. But when you see veterans get political, that's, 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 that's indicative of the times that we have right now. Because it's always a veteran that's willing to die for this country and die for that constitution. And so when we get in office, we view this as what's in the best interest of Americans and America only because we are the ones that are willing to die for every single American. And we are seeing a spike in veterans running for office like you wouldn't believe. Just here in yeah. Texas, there's me. There's a guy named Dan Crenshaw, who's a Navy SEAL. Morgan Luttrell, who's a Navy SEAL. Tony Gonzalez, who's a Navy guy. Troy Nels, who's an Army uh, Lieutenant Colonel. August Fluger, who's an Air Force guy. Uh, Jake Elsey, who's a Naval, Naval, Naval Academy graduate. And that's just in Texas. And I think over the course of the next few cycles, you're going to see more of us get in this fight and fight for what it means to put our American values first. Amen to that. I, I, I love that. Um, it's very clear to me, Wes, you've got a very bright future in this, this you, thing. Bro. And, it, and it's, it's, it's for a lot of very good reasons. The first of which is your intentions are very clear. Your intentions are of the utmost integrity. And um, I, I, you're the kind of guy that makes me want to cheer and it, for Thank a politician you. again. And, and we do need more of you. And one of the things that I noticed, and I hope people pay attention to when they listen to you just now, is your grasp of history. And where we and this moment fit into that span of history and that it's all greater than any single one of us. We are trying to perpetuate the greatest country on the earth and, I, and, it, and it takes some historical knowledge and background, which clearly you got at West Point, uh, to, to, to make people appreciate what it is we have and where we could be going and where we don't want to go. So, uh, kudos to you on that. And, and let's hope some of that history makes its way down to other, other places. Cause it seems to be overlooked in a lot of schools, you know, We're forgetting but, uh, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can't do that. We can't, yeah. it's, it's far too important. Yes. 
I thank you, Wes. Uh, I wish you good luck. I have a feeling we're going to see you in Congress. I hope you won't forget about us here on Sideline Sanity when you get there. And we Anytime. can talk again Anytime about you want me all the things you're I'd doing. I'd be happy to do it. I'd be happy to do I it. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Now I want to interview your dad and your sister and your brother. <laughs> and, yeah, I, My dad's way better I mean, than I me. See what this, <laughs> I want to see what this family's made of, man. This is crazy. Uh, thank you so much to Wesley Hunt. Um, oh, tell people where they can help out if they want to support you. Oh, please. Um, uh, my, my website is wesleyfortexas.com. Uh, that's wesleyfortexas.com, F-O-R. And look, if you just want to see kind of what my platform is, what I'm about, and yeah. my social media handles are on there as well, please take a look. Thank you, Wesley. Appreciate God it. You, man. Thank you so much. You have a great day. You too. This has been Sideline Sanity. Be brave, do good, and check out wesleyfortexas.com. So with the economy the way that it is, which is not great, makes you think about what is smart investing these days. I was given a gift of gold by my mom. My husband and I were gifted some gold for a wedding anniversary and we're really grateful. And I am really grateful to Charles Thorngren, who grow, who joins us now from Legacy Precious Metals, a sponsor of Sideline Sanity. Charles, we appreciate you so much. You know, we're hearing more and more about how inflation ain't transitory after all, and it may be here a while. And, you know, food shelves are getting, the lines are longer. It, this is really, it's not the America I grew up in, and it's, it's worrying a lot of people. So if, if someone's thinking about investing, what do you tell them? You, you know, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Investing nowadays, uh, we, we want to go back to kind of the basics, really, where diversification has always been key and and we hear it we've been told it ad nauseum you know diversify diversify and then everyone puts all their money in the stock market and <laughs> wonders why when there's a pullback they're in trouble diversity means asset class diversity as well you know some real estate um some precious metals these are the things that gives your portfolio the legs to stand through all the storms that will happen financially and, and, and we know that they happen they happen continuously and they recur so that's what diversity is truly meant to do. And that's why people used to talk about diversity. So when people see the value of the dollar declining or they see inflation, um, how do you get the average person like me to understand that gold can still be appreciating or that gold can protect right. against that stuff? How, how does that make sense for people? You know, the, the easiest way to look at it is if you look at gold, right? Gold is the anti-dollar investment. As a dollar gets weaker, gold gets stronger. And we know that because it takes more dollars to buy that gold, just like cars cost more now, right? Um, anytime you have inflation, the item that you're buying costs more. The difference with gold is that it doesn't devalue. It's considered a alternative currency. Basically, when you say that I don't have complete faith that this financial system is not built on a house of cards, or I don't have complete faith in, in what the current Fed is doing to fight inflation, this is where gold comes in. And this is where we see people increase their amount of gold because a diversified portfolio should have some gold regardless. We need to remember that the United States Fed says two to 3% inflation is ideal. So that means for the average saver, if your retirement account's invested, and it's based in dollars that you're going to lose 60% of your purchasing power to inflation by the time you're ready to retire. And that's under the best of terms. And now we can talk about the, oh, it's transitory. Oh, no, maybe I was wrong. Um, maybe we need to do half basis points every month for the rest of the year and then see where it's at next year. These are scary things that mm -hmm. the experts are trying to tell us that maybe we didn't have it right. And this is why people have gold. And this is why it offers that protection. It's interesting. Uh, I, you know, I think people think, well, if I'm investing in gold, do I actually possess the gold in, you know, I have it in a safe. Do I have, how do you get gold? How do you keep gold? Right. And, and physical gold. I mean, this is what we do. So yes, if you're buying it outside of an IRA, we can deliver it right to your home and you can put it in your own safe. You can put it in your safety deposit box. If you don't feel comfortable with that, we do offer storage for our clients as well. Okay. So there's lots of options. 
uh, in the IRA, it's stored for you, just like your IRA account. You don't have access to those stocks. So if you were to take funds from your IRA, you could make that investment and you'd have the retirement account invested in the precious metals as well. And it would be handled just like every other IRA account. That's really interesting. And, and now I'm going to ask you a tough one, and I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm just going to be candid uh, and, and a- ask what I think might be coming to people's minds. Sure. If the experts in Washington are making all these mistakes or they were wrong about inflation, then they're going to look at you and say, hey, Charles, why should I trust what you're telling me and why legacy precious metals is the place to go? I- I'm asking this in an honest sure. way because I because I, I know you want to be transparent about this stuff. So how would you Absolutely. answer that? You know, it really is. is I'm not a politician. Um, <laughs> I have no desire to be a politician. I like what I do, right? I help people prepare their finances. I help people with their retirements. I help people set up their funds so that their children and their grandchildren have something that's there. This is what I do. This is what I do for uh, enjoyment. Um, uh, very big in economics. Um, um, but metals is that thing that it's an alternative asset, right? When I was a stockbroker 30 plus years ago, it was unique kind of then. And then everybody was a stockbroker and everyone had stocks and there was nothing different. There was no protection. Everyone said the same thing. To me, it didn't make sense for everyone to be doing the same thing. If we all do the same thing, then we all fall together. And we know that if you follow the government's direction, you're buying into whatever they want to sell you. Now, it used to be politics was a little different. We have gotten into a place where we can't say that anymore. It's not always for the people. It's We see that. We see that what they're doing with the economy itself. We know that we have to have something else. And this is why we do what we do here at Legacy. And my history is is why people should, you know, give us a call, chat with us and see if it makes sense for them. Last thing I want to ask you about is I remember 2008 and I know a lot of people mm. do. And it, 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 you know, that was a crash and there have been other crashes, but why is it that when the economy crashes, gold has historically risen? I know you said it's sort of the anti-dollar, right? Is there a way in layman's terms to explain why that happens? It's, it's the safe place. Right. When, when, when there's so much risk out there and people are losing so much money, they just want safety. Mm-hmm. So l- let's look at inflation. We know right now we're running close to eight and a half percent. We can dig some real numbers out there and we can debate that, but we'll just take that number as it is. We'll use eight percent. That means everything costs you eight percent more this year than it did last year. And we know it's going to go higher because the Fed's already promised us a lot more interest rate raises right to fight inflation but we know it's not enough when they say things like we'll try to raise half a basis point five times over the next six months and see where the economy's at next year that in itself lets you know you need to find something that doesn't put your livelihood in their hands they're, they're juggling an economy and the stock market, and it was never meant to be that way. So you have to protect yourself. And this is where gold comes in because it is the anti-dollar. The weaker the dollar gets, the stronger gold gets. And, you know, 2008, I remember after it happened, um, the people that would call and try to salvage their retirement accounts. And it was a very devastating time. People would call and they would be crying that they can't retire now. They have to continue to work. They're 67 years old and their plans are gone because they lost half their value. And that's devastating, you know, but this is where those who were involved in gold, they saw gold almost double in price. It offset the losses. It offset the losses. So again, Charles is not suggesting that you put all your money in one place that not even gold, but diversify your assets and precious metals is a good way to go. And legacy precious metals is the only company I trust when I talk about and do my investing in gold and silver, and you can contact them as well. 
LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. I don't know why you would waste another minute thinking about it. Just talk to them. I mean, just ask them, see what your situation can, can manage and handle and might require and just get some answers. Uh, Charles, I appreciate your time. Thanks for this. It's been very educational. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.